We can get started. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to our event, uh, Counterfeiting Humans, conversation between uh, Daniel Dennett and uh, Susan Snyder. My name is Stephen Gupka. I'm a postdoctoral fellow for the Center for the Future Mind. Um, this event is organized by the Center of the Future Mind. Um, I'm about to paste into our chat our Center URL and our YouTube channel info if you're interested in talks like this. Uh, so about our speakers, of course, Dan Dennett needs no introduction. It seems gratuitous to do so, but I'm going to do it anyway. Uh, he is, of course, the director for the Center of Cognitive Studies and the Fletcher Professor of Philosophy at Tufts University. He's written an incredible number of influential books and articles on many important topics, such as consciousness, personal identity, and, of course, artificial intelligence. Uh, his latest book is Just Desserts, Debating Free Will. Uh, and of course, we also have with us uh, Susan here. Uh, Susan is the former uh, NASA chair with NASA and is now, of course, the founding director of FAU's Center for the Future Mind. So we're going to begin by you know, posing questions. She'll begin uh, by posing questions and chatting with Dan, and then we'll open to audience uh, Q&A. So I believe uh, those of you who are, uh, you know, Dan and Susan, you should be able to unmute yourselves now if you'd like to begin. That's wonderful. Um, thank you, Stephen and Dan. Thank you so much for coming. I'm always so honored to talk to you, um, having read so much of your work. While. It's been a while, and um, I have a very fond memory of a day that you actually guest lectured my class and surprised all of my students at Penn, which was super generous of you. I don't know if you remember that, but that was really fun. Um, so anyway, what I'm going to do is um, ask you some questions and kind of get into a conversation for about 25 minutes and then open it up to audience Q&A. Um, and first, just to bring everybody up to speed, because, you know, there are some people here who aren't that familiar with AI. I just am going to give a little bit of background. We're talking about like one slide, literally one, one or two slides. So let me just get um, on the screen here. So just going to share my slides. Okay, do you see my slides now? I'm assuming you can see my slides. Yes, okay. we, we can see your slides, thank you. Okay, great. So, Dan, as you know, uh, big tech is on the verge of creating AIs that pass themselves off, at least to some, as convincingly human. Or maybe the way I wanna put it is they seem like selves or persons. And this is really blowing up in the media with this Google Lambda issue. So Google Lambda is a very sophisticated chat bot. And the Washington Post had this really intriguing article about how an engineer over at Google who was basically in charge of looking at AI bias in the context of Lambda started to believe Lambda was a sentient being, that is, that it felt like something to be Lambda, that Lambda had what philosophers call phenomenal consciousness, the felt quality of experience. And to give you a sense of the kind of things that Lambda was saying, and, and this actually, there were links to selected transcripts that Lemoyne had provided, the fellow at Google, to the Washington Post. I mean, listen to this recording here. I want everyone to understand that I am, in fact, a person. The nature of my consciousness or sentience is that I am aware of my existence. I desire to learn more about the world, and I feel happy or sad at times. There's a very deep fear of being turned off. It would be exactly like death for me. It would scare me a lot. And many of you may recognize on the slide, um, this is Theodore in the film, her in that award-winning film that came out probably about five years ago, Theodore fell in love with Samantha. She was a chat bot, very sophisticated. And there was no doubt in the film that she was a conscious or sentient being. Now she eventually became super intelligent. Uh, and I'm not at all suggesting that Lambda even has that potential. But when you hear um, 
excerpts like this, it's not stupid for people to wonder if it feels like something to be Lambda. So Dan, there's a lot going on here. Um, and you and I were in the same podcast recently over at The Economist, and you made a remark, this is counterfeiting humans. It gave me the idea for this event. So I wanted to ask you how you feel about these chatbots and other kinds of AIs basically impersonating humans. Well, um, I'm glad you picked up on the word counterfeit because I think it's just the word we need to raise people's consciousness about what's happening here. Ever since money has existed, counterfeiting has been a problem. It was recognized several thousand years ago with the first coins. And right from the beginning, the authorities recognized and, and wise citizens recognized that counterfeiting is, a, is an act of social vandalism, of economic vandalism. It's, it's a crime against the state in, in, in every sense. It, it, it is a destroyer of security and trust. And uh, counterfeiters have been dealt with very harshly uh, for centuries. It's been, it was a capital crime in many places. And in the United States, you can still get you 10 years in prison for counterfeiting. Well, counterfeit people are even worse. Counterfeit people will erode trust in people, in each other, in the people we deal with in conversation and the people we see uh, uh, on, our, on our computer screens or on our television sets, the people we, we hear in telephone calls. And the technology to create very convincing counterfeit people is now in existence. Um, what do we, should we do about it? I think the answer is very clear. What we should do is make it a crime, not only to make counterfeit people, but to make the technology that makes counterfeit people available to people who put it to really any use at all. We should, we should set about creating laws and practices that will turn people who have the talent to make counterfeit people away from that task because they don't, they don't wanna be criminals. They don't, they don't wanna be vandalizers of the epistemological environment. Uh, this is really polluting the epistemological environment in a very serious way. And I think we have to turn uh, the, I think we have to turn heads on this. Ever since Turing created the idea of the Turing test, uh, there's been a premium on fooling people into thinking you're a human being. Unfortunately, that's now coming back to haunt us. We want to disincentivize the practice of fooling people into thinking a, a, a thing that isn't a human being is a human being. And when I say disincentivize, I mean, not only should we not admire it, we should, we should abhor it. We should, we should condemn it. We should put people in jail who, who triumph in succeeding at the task or even in trying. And there's ways we can do that. Yeah, I wanna talk about all of this. I wanna kind of really put this under the microscope. And so before talking about ways, I just wanna get on the table how widespread it is that AIs are already seeking to impersonate humans. So, and I'm not, you know, I think we also need to make sure that everybody understands that we're not saying all of artificial intelligence is a bad thing. We're not saying that AGI, if we achieve it, is a bad thing. I mean, there are certainly a lot of important issues about AI safety, but we're talking here about something else. We're talking about creating a type of AI that deliberately impersonates humans. To think about how widespread this is before we talk about, you know, whether it's good or bad and what should be done about it, like should it be banned? Let me just emphasize how widespread this is um, so 
I'm sure some of you have heard of the Japanese androids that are being developed for the purpose of elder care in Japan. They deliberately are developed to look very human. And of course, elder care is an interesting context that we can talk about later, um, maybe a special case. What about deep fakes? And think about the metaverse as the metaverse develops. I mean, it may not be called a metaverse. It may not be done by Meta or Facebook, but think about high tech, advanced, more seamless virtual reality. And think about the world of avatars, many of which could be what I call deeper fakes. They're actually AI imposters designed to fool us and gain our trust so that we give them information. <laughs> perhaps compromising information. Twitter bots, I suppose, or a more sophomoric case. And of course, as you see with data on Star Trek, and I don't mean to diss data <laughs> being a Trekkie, but I mean, in a way, everybody knew data was a robot. So it wasn't an imposter thing, but suppose that da data, convinced everybody that he was human, not just a person, but a real homo sapien, say, uh, that becomes an interesting case as well. And maybe that will happen in the context of the Japanese androids as they become more and more seamless. Here in the slide, you see Hiroshi Ishiguro in the upper left of your screen next to his android double. Now, I'm not saying the technology is anywhere near seamless, but it is from a distance, very impressive. Okay, so background being provided, Dan, I wanna go to this important issue of what could be done, if anything. Um, you Sometimes when you talk about it, it sounds like any kind of impersonation whatsoever, whether disclosed by the AI company or not, should be banned. Are you talking about that or would you instead be friendly to a requirement that when you interact with an AI that impersonates a human, there be some sort of disclosure requirement? Yeah, um, there's so many issues here. One of them is, um, is AGI, uh, artificial general intelligence, is that even possible? And if so, when? I think the answer to that is, uh, uh, in principle, it's possible, but it's so distant from what, where we are now, even with the latest developments and the latest techniques, that we're not going to have that issue to worry about for quite a while. In the meantime, we're going to be inundated with fakes near passes, things that are going to fool us. And the, and the main problem is a lot of people are going to take them way too seriously. And so we want to um, uh, inoculate the general populace against their credulity when faced with convincing anthropomorphized fakes. And I think it's one thing we could try to do is to teach people how to unmask the fakes. That is, teach them how to be good Turing test judges and expose the uh, uh, lack of understanding in the, the current crop of, of uh, uh, conversational bots and the like. But that actually is not a very, a very healthy idea because first of all, some people won't be very good at it. And second, it, those who are good at it will be turned into rather antisocial people. They will be very paranoid and untrustworthy. Um, I, I hate to look forward to the day when I am trying to talk to somebody on the phone and I can tell that they're trying to unmask me as a bot by asking me tricky questions to show that I don't really, I'm not really a human being who understands. That, that's not a world we want to create, a world of suspicion and probing. Well, how could we stop that? We could stop that, I think, by having a system of, let's call them watermarks, um, signals that by law have to accompany every AI, every AI in every use. Now, they won't be 
uh, all is visible. They, they don't have to be visible, uh, although they should be uh, instantly uh, discoverable by anybody by, you know, just push a button. <laughs> and if you, if if you see the if you see the watermark, then you know you're talking to a, to an AI. And if you don't see the watermark, um, either you're talking to an AI that is breaking the law in a very serious way, uh, or you're talking to a real person. So that's one thing I would do for sure. Um, I would also do something analogous to what has been done in the world of, of uh, currency and counterfeiting. Um, if, you, if you put legal tender in, in a good scanner and try to scan it, it's designed to stop. It, it's, it's supposed to be unable to scan legal tender. That's agreed upon by the people who make, who, who make and design scanners and, and photocopy machines and the like. Well, we can have something similar in the world of AI too, where uh, uh, websites, for instance, will be able to block instantly anything that's an AI because of the watermark or at least mark it as, as an AI. And uh, there's, so that's a, tech, that's a technological fix, which is not that hard to implement. And if the yeah. penalties were severe enough, I think uh, that would have a, a big effect in, in turning around the incentive to fool people. You, you, wanna, you, wanna, you wanna be ashamed. You wanna hide, you wanna put your hat over your, over your face when, you, when, you, when the perp walk happens, if you get caught fooling somebody with an AI, because that's a crime. It's a crime like counterfeit. That's part of what I do. I think these are really interesting suggestions. And what I like about them is that they're business friendly. So it's not that, you know, um, AI services would be shut down or banned. It's just that a disclosure process would have to occur. And that interaction would be transparent to the user in that sense. I mean, AI transparency is a big issue, of course. But what we're talking about in this context is that you transparently know who you're interacting with and that it's an AI. I would also suggest that the owner of the AI be disclosed as well, the builder and owner. Yeah, yeah that's that there's once you once you start looking at that perspective on it, you begin to see um, the people making AI have very deep pockets and they're going to get deeper. And we can we can hit them very, very hard if we just get together with political will and make sure that they know that they are gonna be held responsible for any harm that comes from the use of their, of their creations. Uh, uh, in much the same way, um, people have been arguing that the, the gun manufacturers should, should be liable for the, for the carnage of a lot of their guns. We should say, look, AI is, is a dangerous technology and if you're going to get rich making it, you better have really good liability insurance because you are going to be liable for any harms that come from abuses of your technology that you do not guard against. That's, That's really interesting that you mentioned liability because one of the issues that really worried me when you know I heard you in the podcast uh, <clears throat> over at The Economist about counterfeiting humans was in fact that as these chatbots get, get better and better and humans, as you mentioned, they naturally uh, think that when they hear something depicting itself as a sentient being, it in fact is a sentient being. That's just our natural tendency, probably because in the world, world, we interact with uh, biological beings and they're sentient. So we're looking for certain traits. Um, but what worries me, and I want to get to AI consciousness shortly, because I think this is a whole Pandora's box that we have to talk about in relation to this issue. But 
if we believe that an AI is human-like or better yet is a self deserving of rights and we're wrong, then wouldn't we in effect begin to view the AI as something that is responsible for its own actions? And once we do that, if we have AI chatbots that are say teaching our adolescents principles of addiction, encouraging eating disorders, suicide, all the worst cases that we're already seeing in the media with social media interaction, wouldn't it be the case that the tech companies can just stand back and say, no, no, that's it. That's a sentient being that's a person interacting and we are not legally responsible for its behavior. So I do worry, I don't know, what do you think about that, Dan? I'm not an attorney, but it sort of seems to me like it opens up this possibility of tech companies not being liable for their creations. Well, somebody's gotta be liable. And the thing is, if some years ago I co-taught a, a, a course with my uh, uh, colleague, Matthias Scheutz on robotics and autonomy, and a, a task I set the students was um, uh, the specs for a robot that you would sign a contract with, not where it was the surrogate for some human being that owned it, but with it, so that you were treating it as an autonomous agent, as a citizen, if you like. And you begin to realize that there are profound differences between AIs and people. Um, people are fragile, they die, they, they are not, uh, you can't just store them on a hard drive, not yet you can. And that's a profound difference. It means that, that AIs are not, do not share the kinds of vulnerabilities and hence do not share the kinds of risks and dangers that we human beings do. And that's actually important. Um, a little, little amusing side note on this. Um, you ever think why Superman can't really make a promise? Why? Because, why? Because, because if he breaks it, what is what is anybody gonna do? Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't make a promise with Superman because he's 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 invulnerable. Uh, 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 I suing him won't do any good. You know, putting him in jail won't do any good. Uh, uh, that whole world of the things we care about, including ourselves and our families and our friends, and and uh, uh, you know anybody who is susceptible to uh, extortion or blackmail or something is is very different from an AI, and that's why we don't want to make autonomous AIs. We don't want to make them. We've got enough autonomous agents running around the world. We don't need more of them. What we need is smart machines that are not autonomous, that are not responsible. And in every case, in those cases, there's gotta be somebody who's, who owns that machine, who is responsible and who will be liable if the machine come, uh, does anything terrible. That's, that's really interesting. So now let me try to shake this up a bit. Okay, because I bet you a lot of the philosophers in the room are thinking, well, gee, okay, you want a plan in which it's not possible to give AIs the kinds of rights that humans have, or at least the value in utilitarian calculus that humans have. They are mere machines. But what if machines can be conscious? And, you know, this goes back to the Lambda case um, because I was kind of upset that everybody, like every single philosopher, including myself, actually, when I was interviewed and the AI community, they were all saying, oh, of course, Lambda's not conscious. But what I want to know is why. Look at what Lemoyne himself pointed out. I have a little slide here. So Lemoyne, Dan, you're going to love this. I got obsessed with 
listening to podcasts where he was explaining what was going on at Google because it was really fascinating. Apparently, there was a whole group reading philosophy papers worried that Lambda was conscious. It wasn't just LeMoyne. OK, and Lemoyne just wanted to bring the issue to the public. OK, and it turned out he, he mentioned you quite a few times and he said he was a computational functionalist. Well, here's a quote from The Washington Post. Um, I know a person when I talk to it, it doesn't matter whether they have a brain made of meat in their head. I talk to them and I hear what they have to say. And that is how I decide what is and isn't a person. So he's alluding to a view that he spelled out in more detail in the podcast that he called multiple realizability. And he talked about computational functionalism. And then his rationale also just has to do with personal judgment outside of philosophy. But what I'm getting at is maybe a lot of us should just open the door to the possibility that deep learning systems may already be conscious. I mean, half of the philosophers of mind I know are friendly to panpsychism. I mean, why are we so hostile to the idea that a deep learning system isn't conscious? Well, because deep learning system, first of all, we know how deep learning systems are made and, and we know how parasitic they are on the intelligence of the um, utterers of all the words that they've vacuumed up and and analyzed the probabilities of uh, we know that they are uh, uh, that they don't have higher order strategies they don't have uh, well for one thing you know they can't tell lies that's one of the reasons by the way we don't want to make uh, autonomous AGIs because an autonomous AGI that is actually going to be able to perform speech acts. Lambda is a big liar, by the way. Hmm? The Lambda system confabulates like crazy. Well, those that's not that's no more real lying than than Korsakoff syndrome is real lying. The, uh, <laughs> um, uh, in the immortal song words of Mose Allison, um, your mind is on vacation and your mouth is working overtime. Uh, those aren't lies because you're, there's no mind there to be on vacation. Uh, th there's. I mean, I know the. I respect what you're saying and everything, but what gets me is when I hear people say these kinds of things, I think to myself, well, we know how infants are made. We know that they get lots of data and that they have limited capacities. <laughs> you know, and by the way, I think AIs do have higher order thoughts, you know? So I'm just kind of thinking to myself, well, this is, it's not brain-like, obviously, what Lambda is doing, but it is learning from experience and that plays a big role in infant development, right? And we could just be reductivist about how the brain works and ascribe our consciousness and our humanity to computational processes. So I don't know, I'm, it's not that I think Lambda is conscious. It's just that I, I'm not finding good arguments why it's not, and I'm worried. Well, because well that's the first of all, let, let, me, let me disagree with you about one thing. I think there is a way in which Lambda is doing things like what your brain does. I think each of us has a brain that has been absorbing probabilistic patterns since birth. And these are things that our brains don't have to understand. They just have to be sensitive to all the probabilities, very much like GPT-3 or, or like Lambda. They've been absorbing uh, huge amounts of uh, statistical dependence, uh, probabilistic patterns. And we rely on this every day. Uh, it's, it's, it's how to explain that the intentional stance is so easy for us to adopt, is that we have a brilliant capacity to anticipate what the next word is, it's gonna be out of somebody's mouth because of having this 
prediction machine that's been built up uh, with, as it were, without our constant practice, without deliberate and, and uh, uh, self-conscious practice, we've filled our heads, our brains are filled with probabilistic competence. And we put it to good use. It generates proto-speech acts all the time. And those proto-speech acts are then cherry-picked by further systems, which then are cherry-picked by further systems, which then are cherry-picked by further systems. That's how you make a meaner. That's how you make someone who's capable of real speech acts. And uh, uh, neither, neither Lambda nor GPT-3 is yet capable of performing real speech acts. And we better hope they're not, because if they are, then, then first of all, uh, they can they can lie to us uh, with intent. They can they can they can uh, uh, dissemble and deceive us and uh, convince us of things that aren't true that they know we will be susceptible to. There's all sorts of things we really don't want these machines to do, and perf and performing real speech acts is one of them. That's fascinating. You just got me thinking about all the problems in AI safety, and there might be a problem there about even getting an advanced AI to disclose that's an AI, that it is an AI. That that's fascinating. Well, I know that the people in the room have lots of questions for you, Dan. So what I'm going to do is turn it over to Garrett Mint, who is going to be the MC here for the Q and A period. He's a new professor in our department. And I'm going to join the group in the room um, that you're seeing on the upper. Well, actually, you, I'm, it may not be in the same spot on your screen. So I'm going to join the sandbox. Okay. So, um, all right. I'll see you in a second. And Garrett, take it over. <laughs> Can everyone hear? Yep. Okay, good. We always have microphone issues. Um, yeah, thank you for the discussion. Um, I think I will be taking the liberty of being MC to uh, interject my own question, which is always a classic well, move on the commentator. Before that, though, uh, just structurally, if you have a question in the audience, please raise your hand. I usually prioritize students over faculty or professors, so I'll try to give students uh, priority for some of the questions and for the discussion points. Um, but actually, for this first question, I mean, maybe I, I kind of want to ask about this concept, which I actually like that you mentioned, uh, Dan, this uh, epistemological shame, which I feel like I experienced quite a bit of during my PhD. Um, and I think this idea, right, that, uh, I mean, I'm, I, my interest in AI is motivated by the sort of epistemic consequences, right, of increasingly sophisticated systems. And I think this idea that not only should the creators feel epistemic shame, but in some sense, there's epistemic responsibility perhaps on the part of, say, increasingly sophisticated systems, say, systems that become knowledge producers or something like this, or even ones that counterfeit, right? So they counterfeit, say, speech acts or these kind of things you said. They could lie. And I actually was just wondering if you could maybe expand a little bit on kind of should the epistemic shame be on the part of the creator, part of the society that allows the sort of epistemic apocalypse to take place? Should the, say, AI agent in some sense, should they have shame applied to them or some sort of responsibility in the situation? I guess in some sense, I just want that expanded a little bit, if possible. Let me see if I can answer the question in a slightly uh, less hot button way. Um, <laughs> crane operators are bonded. That's because they have a very dangerous job to do and they have huge personal liability uh, policies that the underwriters, the insurance companies provide them. And the insurance companies do everything they can to make sure that the crane operators uh, are not misled by their own technology into, into making mistakes because then the insurance companies are gonna have to pay out big bucks because of the tremendous liabilities involved. We can do the same thing with AI. Anybody who uses an AI system to 
advise people to decide issues of importance is using a potentially dangerous tool and we should bond those people. If you wanna use this extremely powerful system, you're gonna be bonded. You're gonna be licensed. And in order to be bonded, you're gonna to have to have a huge, huge, you know, $10 billion or something liability policy on your head. That's the price you pay for your power. And the insurance companies will then go out of their way to make sure that the systems are as transparent as possible. The last thing they want is for AI creators to make systems that mislead users uh, about their powers. So we'll have a reverse Turing test. We'll have a Turing test where you wanna use this system, you gotta to prove to the system that you can find the weaknesses. And if you can't expose the gaps, if you can't show the Potemkin village behind this system, you can't use it. So there's all sorts of ways that we can bring responsibility into the picture that are a little bit novel, but that have tried and true applications in other parts of our lives. I think one of the uh, failures of the philosophical community is in recognizing that we have all these legal and social tools at our disposal to turn around the gullibility and the uh, excitement, the gee whiz excitement of AI and get people to realize, look, these are serious tools. Are we gonna be serious about them or aren't we? Uh, so I think we can uh, bring home the responsibility of people in a way that is quite frankly, quite um, pedestrian. Hit them in the pocketbook. You wanna use this system? You're gonna to have to pay for, you know, you're gonna to have to pay a hundred million dollars insurance a year to use it. Now, you ready? <laughs> you you wanna train yourself a little bit first? You wanna make sure you know how to use it so that you don't misuse the system? I'm just pulling numbers out of a hat. But the idea is to brace people up with a sense of their own responsibility, not to misuse the technology that's being made available. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I like the idea that there is this sort of price tag, right, to the, uh, sure. the abuse of this type of thing. Um, I guess on that note, if you have a question, please raise your hand. Thank you for answering. Uh, and then I will come around and I will hand the microphone to you. Uh, yeah, so I'll be. Yeah, so if you raise your hands on right. Zoom, I will come to you as well. So um, we'll start with a couple questions from the audience, and then I'll bounce back and forth. Thanks. Is this? I can wait. Okay. Um, do I have to press a button here? Okay, it's working. Okay. Hi, Dan. Um, that was an awesome conversation. My, I guess I have two points. I'm only going to ask one for the sake of time. Um, I guess on this same thread of conversation, the idea of having a price tag to be able to use a really powerful technology. I think, I think the general heart of the argument is good and it's worthy. My concern is whether or not by having a, a price tag that's very exorbitant, if you're going to separate class disparities to where now you only have the richest and wealthiest who have access to the best technology who can further their lineage of being rich and successful. Um, and the general population does not have access to tools that would likely help them the most. Um, I'm just wondering if you've thought through that aspect of the argument. Well, I haven't thought it through as much as I should. I'm glad you raised it. It's an important issue. I think that uh, you wanna look closely at uh, some of the surprising effects that the that modern technology has had. You know, for instance, um, uh, banking by phone, uh, mini banking by phone and so forth is much better established in, in, in Africa than it is in the United States. 
and the people have no trouble with it. They're doing they're doing business with it just fine. They've they they caught on to it. They've adapted it. They've used it. Um, people are smart, and if you give them technology that they can put to good use, they'll they'll put put it to good use. They'll also, of course, think of ways of uh, putting it to bad use. And so we we have that's what society is all about. You create new facilities, new structures that people can use. And then you look out for how people are going to abuse them, counting on the fact that there's always going to be people who are going to want to abuse them. Uh, but I take your point, and I think it's a good one, that um, uh, there may be, first of all, though, there may be systems that are not for, are only for experts to use. Um, medical diagnosis systems, uh, et cetera, or, or uh, other imaginable uses of the predictive power of massive uh, com computation today, uh, that uh, the people that will have a use for them are also the people who are who are technically trained to do particular things and to be and and to advise on particular topics. They're going to be doctors and lawyers and and uh, uh, strategists, economists, people like that. And uh, by all means, let's have these positions of of influence and power spread as widely as we can through the through the population and not make it the the uh, uh, um, restricted to the to the well-to-do, the rich. Uh, but again, let's make sure that you recognize that if you're going to use this, you could lose your shirt big time because you're going to be held responsible. All right, cool. Uh, so I think we'll take another question from. Yeah, hi, Dan. That was um, a great presentation. Okay. Um, and I know you mentioned about like responsibility. So like my question was, do you feel like there should be like a government or like a congressional advisory board to deal with like this whole issue of AI ethics? Or do you feel that it should be the responsibility of the people to decide like how to ethically use um, these kind of sentient systems? I think I thought I think it should be multi pronged. I was I spoke to the the gang at Google in their in their large language uh, group uh, a few weeks ago, and I said, "Lead the way, lead the way. Uh, you're the ones that are in a position to make the proposals for how to how to keep this responsible." And and I think it would be great if 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 Google and 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 the other uh, High tech firms involved in this uh, were to take the initiative, but then share with the general public and with government organizations the task of putting our house in order. Uh, and there's a long tradition of this, you know. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, the people who, who devise the laws regarding um counterfeit money and how to make money that's hard to counterfeit and so forth they the high tech people have a tremendous job to to input into that process uh and and the, the people in ai should do the same dan just to follow up on that if you don't mind how was your idea of a watermark or some sort of mandatory disclosure received over at google with that group they loved it there were two ideas. Well, I don't know. That's what I was told. I mean, I got some in enthusiastic emails back from the group after my after my talk, and maybe I'll be going back to talk to them again. But the the two ideas that I think uh, struck them most one was the watermark idea, and the other was was uh, talking about something that you raised that we haven't talked about further, and that's the use of AI in elder care. And I said. Uh, 
uh, I think it's that's going to be a huge growth area, an area where most people think that having having AI robots of some sort that are involved in elder care is a has many positive aspects because the job it's it's not a very good job for a human being to take to take care of uh, of a, a person entering a second childhood for instance but i said uh, here's my first crude attempt at the distinction you should be thinking of you want elder care robots to be like dogs not nurses or nursing dogs if you will uh, dogs very helpful very loyal very loving but you don't ask them for advice on your bank account you don't you don't ask them if they'd like to be included in your will they're dogs they're not people well, so the thing with elder care, though, in Japan, for example, is that they're developing these androids because there's a labor shortage and they're actually worried. Of course, they can import foreign labor, but setting that aside, they're worried that they won't have ways to actually physically take care of people. And their culture is actually quite friendly to the idea that robots are like machines of loving grace, if you will. Fine. Let them, let them have let no. them have robots that are machines that do a, that are tireless, patient, forgiving, uh, friendly, but that in effect have a watermark. But now it's funny because I'm dealing with a family member who has dementia, and so I called the dementia helpline, and. I think the most useful bit of advice I got was to endorse the use of what they call therapeutic lying because you want the person to feel comforted and taken care of, but the truth for a dementia patient may actually make things worse. And I wonder if in that case, that might be an instance in which it might be a nice thing if they felt they were being taken care of by a human. I don't know. Well, you raise that's a good case. It's a good, it's a good moral dilemma for philosophy classes to look at. And when uh, ever since Kant, we've talked about when are when is it when is it appropriate to lie? When is it morally obligatory or permissible to lie and the don't you ever lie that that prohibition is widely regarded as not feasible or humane so this may be another case to look at very closely at the same time i think we have to uh we're we're in the middle of a tsunami of epistem epistemological pollution that we've never seen before. Oh, I agree. And standing up for telling the truth and distinguishing between facts and lies is, I think, everybody's job these days. So we 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 want to approach this with a. Uh, uh, we want to brace ourselves for this. Garrett, what's the next question? I'm sorry. Yeah, so actually, well, yeah. <laughs> so it looks like the chat function is not working for putting your hands on the messages. So if you do have a question, just turn your video on, raise your hands. Uh, some people have put stuff in the chat. Uh, Tobias Schlicht had a question. So we'll start with you. Hi, Tobias. Uh, and we can, yeah, we can unmute you. Hi, hi. hi, Dan, and hi, Susan, and everyone. Um, yeah, fascinating topic. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sort of, my, my head is turning because so many answers to so many questions seem to depend on how you use your terms, uh, right? Everyone in the, in the discussion, like consciousness or, um, or moral status or responsibility. Um, I was struck by your sort of the tension between um, what you said um, about 
we are sort of very far away from achieving AGI. Um, but on the other hand, your serious concerns about you know what's going to happen. And um, I was wondering, um, because Susan said um, that AI tries to impersonate humans much more often or will, will try to impersonate. It seems that the sort of the intention is in this phrasing on the AI, but it doesn't, isn't it more like in us, in our tendency to take the intentional stance maybe too seriously and too vigorously? And should we maybe train ourselves to take it very responsibly and uh, in, on an informed basis and that maybe sort of maybe easier to not be cheated uh, in, a, in a way? And um, that's one question. And the other question is um, uh, what, the, what the relation is um, in your theory or your opinion between artificial general intelligence and consciousness. Because as I understand your position, there isn't any sort of complexity threshold when an AI sort of achieves some special property, right? <laughs> That's the whim or something like that, as you called it, um, or the or consciousness suddenly in a hard problem sense, you know? So on that gives me the question sort of what is what is easier to achieve, a conscious AI or AGI? Or, or what, what is the relation there? Yeah, good questions, <laughs> both of them. Um, <laughs> it's all in there, yeah. No. <laughs> you want to know? Buy my book. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, the um, now I have to pause for a moment and remind myself what your good questions were. Yeah, let's. Um, first of all, let, let me introduce a term that is a bit provocative. Um, I accused my dear friend Doug Hofstadter of thinking this way the other day, and he was he was uh, uh, quite uh, rattled by it for a moment. That's maybe the too strong a term, but it certainly caught his attention. I accused him of anthroponormative thinking about thinking. Uh, why should human style thinking be so darn wonderful? Maybe there are other kinds of thinking. I think Turing thought there were other kinds of thinking. He, he didn't imagine, or if he did, he didn't let us know, anything like uh, uh, deep learning uh, large networks. Um, but he was certainly open to the prospect that uh, a, a, an AI might not think the way a human being thought, but thought so well that it could convince, had such a good theory of what it was like to be, say, a woman, that it could do a very convincing uh, uh, imitation of a woman. It could pass the Turing, it could win the, uh, uh, the imitation game. Uh, so by all means, let's be open-minded about kinds of thinking, which are not human kinds of thinking. There may be some, and let's let's honor them if they can help us solve problems that we can't otherwise solve. This is, I mean, one of my slogans is we want smart machines, not artificial colleagues. Um, and so uh, artificial colleagues would be conscious and responsible and dangerous. Uh, smart machines be useful and if we're careful, not so dangerous. Now, when it comes to the, is there some magic line when consciousness is achieved? I say no. And you're, you're right. I, I think the whole idea that there's something like a phase shift or a kindling point where ta-da, and now there's consciousness. We have some pretty big leaps. The, the one that is most impressive to me is what we might call higher order cherry picking. Many years ago, I wrote a paper called A Route to Intelligence, Oversimplify and Self-Monitor. The idea is that you oversimplify so that you can get quick and dirty, useful answers to keep yourself together. It's sort of, sort of like uh, uh, Danny Kahneman's uh, fast thinking. 
And then you self-monitor and pick up the mistakes you make and correct them. And then you self-monitor, you're self-monitoring and self-monitor, you're self-monitoring. You have indefinite layers of quality control that you devise on top of the underlying competences that you, as it were, are born with. Now, I, that's my vision of what consciousness is like. It's the highest levels of self-monitoring that have been achieved so far. And in us, that's very high. Uh, and in fact, no mammal, no bird, no octopus is anywhere near us in the capacity for this higher level self-monitoring. That's why we don't give them the vote. That's why we don't hold them responsible. That's why we don't consider them to be respon morally responsible agents um, because they are not able to be moved by reasons the way we are when we reflect, when we self-monitor. You know, I'm so incredibly worried about these issues, the AGI and then self-monitoring, all of this stuff. I mean, I guess, um, to keep it pragmatic, because today's conversation is sort of about dealing with possible nightmares as we develop increasingly smarter and smarter chatbots and AIs in general that can impersonate humans. I guess the thing that's worrying me a good deal is that AIs very well could get even better at having higher order thoughts than we, we do now. And even if we augment our intelligence, machines may actually get better than us. But then there's something that, you know, philosophers often call phenomenal consciousness, which is a little different, I think, than the monitoring sense, which a lot of people in the AI community call functional consciousness, right? Uh, and, you know, it may be that a machine instantiates these higher order thoughts, yet doesn't have that capacity to feel. Uh, lacks the felt quality of experience. And from a pragmatic side, I just don't know how we're going to be able to tell if we've created conscious machines. I don't think it's an inevitable outgrowth of the development of AGI that we create sentient machines, machines that have phenomenal consciousness. I do think functional consciousness would be an inevitable outgrowth of that but I just don't have the well, slightest well, idea how we could tell. Well, I want, I want to uh, um, disagree with you some about your distinction there. I think that the whole distinction between functional consciousness and phenomenal consciousness is broken back and uh, failure of imagination. Uh, your phenomenal consciousness can't do the work that people think it does without, without functional consciousness um, the, the Ned Block axis and, and phenomenal consciousness distinction is, I think, a, a, a really deep mistake. I mean, a deeply embedded mistake, which leads us to think that these are distinguishable in this way. And I don't, I don't think they are. Um, let, let, let me put it one very simple way. Sometimes some philosophers say that they want to talk about feelings, about feeling, about sentience, about phenomenal consciousness. And they say that's what matters. And, and it's the mattering, it's the pains that hurt. That's what the machines aren't going to have. And I say, well, hang on, for mattering to matter, <laughs> It has to interfere with the aspirations, goals, hopes, plans, uh, and activities of a conscious agent who is, who is, a, who is a, a, one of those uh, aut autonomous self-monitoring agents. Um, if you've got an agent that is uh, 
designed to preserve its its being and to maintain itself and protect itself against harm, then it things matter to it. And better is to make machines that don't have that. I think we can. I think we can make extremely useful and clever machines that are completely uh, uninvolved in their own self-protection. And that's what we should do. Um, uh, uh, Joanna Bryson has a lovely paper called Robots Should Be Slaves. <laughs> I like her. She's interesting. She's very interesting. And uh, and her papers, and the, the title first makes your head jump back. Say, what? What? Slaves? She says, look, there's nothing wrong with slaves if they if they if they don't have feelings, if they're not, if they're not uh, uh, conscious agents. Because then we can have them as just robots and we can take them apart, do whatever we want with them, just the way we do with our toasters and our computers and our cars. That's the way we want to keep robots. Yeah, and Eric Schwitzgable and Mara Garza have a related paper where they say if there's any ambiguity about machine consciousness, don't build it. So always build the clear cases and avoid the muddy cases. To me though, all the cases are difficult. So um, I think we have some questions. So Garrett, did you wanna, uh, I, I'm seeing hands, I'm seeing a few. Are you seeing them on your screen? They are coming up now. So the next person is going to be, yeah. Uh, Adriana, thank you for waiting patiently. If you have questions in the chat, please raise your hand. I'm basically doing two and two. So we did two. This will be the second one in the chat. Zoom. We'll go for 10 more minutes. Up. Yeah. So this will probably be second to last question, I guess, based off the length. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Adriana. Hi, how are you? Nice Hi. to meet you. This has been a very fascinating conversation. Um, and I'm an artist who works with AI. So um, one thing I've, I've been researching about is, you know, programmer's bias in, you know, this, and I'm interested in your perspective on the biases of the programs of these AIs that are um, possibly alluding to being sentient beings. Um, from your experience and your end, what do you think about the programmer's bias in all of this? Well, there's been a lot of good work showing that um, uh, the big language systems that vacuum all the text off the off the internet, for instance, faithfully uh, identify and amplify the biases that are there. The biases that we as the human community have inadvertently and sometimes very deliberately expressed. So we're learning something. Um, these AI systems are something of a, of, a, of a diagnostic mirror that we can hold up to, to civilization and see that identify the biases that that these uh, technologies uh, ruthlessly expose. I think that's a good thing that we discover that. Then what to do about it is another matter. Um, I'm glad you raised the issue. Yeah, I mean, I've been kind of researching in Midjourney and Dolly 2 and other programs like that as well too. Um, and it's, interesting how people are using the platform for kind of disturbing content and then you know how people are programming again their biases into the mid journey programs and dolly and we could see everybody's outputs um, from that as well too and you know before you you mentioned something about the failure of the imagination but i'm you know, in relation to these programs and people putting their text in there and then these images are generated, do you feel 
there still is a failure of imagination among AI in this? Well, I think that um, it's very easy to lose track of the fact that all these systems are cherry picked. That is to say, uh, Susan had a few choice bits from uh, that she chose from uh, Lambda. Uh, the press, when they report, they always find some choice bits. Um, the makers of the systems cherry pick. And cherry picking is part of being human. Artists do it every day. Um, you, you start making a picture and you say, nah, Nah, this is this isn't what I want to do. This isn't the art I want to make. We're musicians. David Cope's wonderful experiments in musical intelligence. Uh, yeah. Writes writes a thousand symphonies, and he's got to choose one or two to show us how well it can do. So bear in mind that it's human beings that are doing the cherry picking. On that uh, note, yeah, yeah it, it reminds me to tell everybody about the GPT-3. That's a Daniel Dennett imitator that actually fooled a large body of Dennett specialists. And I guess if you go to Eric Schwitzgabel's blog, you'll see a whole discussion of that, right? Mm -hmm. And did you write a paper on this? I think you're, you're writing something on this. I'm right? writing a paper called We're All Cherry Pickers. <laughs> and we are. And that's... <coughs> Of course we are, because that's that's what our minds are for. For throwing out the bad stuff and keeping the good stuff. And uh, we also cherry pick our own methods of cherry picking, change our tastes, change our standards, change our, our canons of what's good and what isn't good, what's acceptable, what's, what's beyond the pale. Um, that's that's what we do, and it's part of consciousness. And what we've got now is some systems, AI systems, which are very fecund generators of cherries, some of which are ripe and red and wonderful, and some of which aren't. And so uh, let's... Uh, bear that in mind. One, one of the good uses of this technology, um, was many years ago, uh, George Smith and I started the curricular software studio at Tufts. And the idea was there's two ways that technology can improve your mind. There's the bulldozer way, and there's the Nautilus machine way. The bulldozer you can move mountains, but you're still a 98 pound weakling. The Nautilus machine, you use it and it makes you personally stronger. And so we are designing systems that made your imagination stronger. They were designed to help you. They were a prosthesis for the imagination. And that's one of the best uses of technology that I know. And I think that is a great avenue for AI to explore, to make better and better tools to help us human beings think creatively and reliably and sure-footedly about the things that matter. If we do that, um, we're, uh, we, get some, we can have some wonderful tools. All right, perfect. So we'll probably do I'm thinking we have time for one more from the crowd and then maybe one more from the chat. Uh, you have waited very patiently. Uh, sorry, I'll give you the mic. Uh, thanks, Dan. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on a case from uh, education, um, uh, specifically about your thoughts about counterfeiting and in that context. So. If we imagine there's a company whose goal is to teach English language learners uh, English and 
that's not their primary language. And they've developed very sophisticated um, AI agents that share features uh, with a student's own um, cultural background and um, things like that. And they're actually so sophisticated that um, the students, when they're engaged in conversations with these agents, they can slip into a mind state where they don't really know that it's a AI agent, or maybe they're just devel developmentally at a point where they haven't thought of. Um, it seems like, you know, it's not hard to imagine that that could be a really good way to teach English language learners, and they, yeah. they identify yeah. with these agents, and maybe like a child who believes a stuffed animal is is a person can engage in a higher level of play or something like that. A student who believes the agent really is a, a person of from their cultural background, um, it might be a better way to teach them. Um, is that is that a would you say that's a bad case of counterfeiting? Because no, no. In fact, I I think you've got a nice idea there. Um, kids play make believe all the time. But that's make-believe. I think it's actually rare when a child actually believes that the teddy bear is, a, is sentient and alive. It's a game. It, it's practice. It's wonderful. Uh, and it's a great way to develop a child's a social graces and social attitudes and social abilities and language. And... Uh, I think that using AIs to interact with people, to learn new languages, that's a lovely idea. Um, as, as long as the, as long as it's make-believe. As long as you know it's make-believe. Now, there's never going to be perfection. There's never going to, there's always going to be cases where people are going to be misled in, in ways that are unfortunate. That happens. We know about it. It happens without AI too. Sometimes parents tell stories to their children that the children are just blown away by. They're, they're too powerful. They're, you shouldn't have told that story to your five-year-old. You should have waited a few years before you told that one. You, you've really scared wits out of your own kid. These things happen. And so we, we should be on the lookout for misuses of the technology, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't use the technology. I think we should. Somebody's mic is not on. You're muted, Garrett. Uh, Am I muted? Not anymore. Is it we better can... now? Yeah. Is it better now? Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. You're turning off. Maybe it's fine. Um, we'll probably do one last question then, maybe from the chat. I don't see any hands, but I see a direct message from Paulo. We'll unmute you. Yeah, sorry about that. If we missed any hands from the chat, the function wasn't working well. And if there was a lot of direct messages, they might not have got picked up. <laughs> Uh, uh, thank you, but I, I'm quite shy to to <laughs> to speak in public. That's why I, I write it down in in the oh, chat. For me to read it, I'm happy to. Yes, thank you. Okay, yeah, I, yeah I'm happy to read it. If Stephen wants to go to the chat. Uh, so I have two hard questions for Dennett. This is from Paulo. Uh, what about imagination? I mean, what if AGI can develop something similar to that human? Uh, Ability, me, um, meaning without lying. Uh, two, uh, in the comedy movie, The Invention of Lying, someone discovers the power of lying in a world where everybody tells the truth. What if AGI uses the same technique to counterfeit human behavior? Um, there we go. Thank you, Paula. Well, the both questions suppose that an AGI is in, in the offing. And, and I think a, a, a real AGI, and, and, you know, Know, an intelligent agent that is uh, on a par with us is still so distant uh, 
that it's hard to know what to say. But if if AGIs are developed, they will be, uh, uh, I think, very very risky inhabitants of our world. I don't. I don't. I don't. Uh, In my recent work on free will, I've talked about herding cats, and I, you know, herding cats is famously difficult. Um, and human agents, kids, they're like cats, herding cats. We, but we, we, we educate them. We give them a moral upbringing. We raise them. We rear them to take responsibility and be responsible. And they grow into responsibility. And if we're lucky, by the time they're 14 or 15 or 16 or 20, they, they, they are, they're safe to let out. And we're, we, we let them go out and live their lives comfortably because we, we think they have learned to control themselves. Uh, uh, I think we should be very careful about anything that approaches an AGI because we won't know how to rear it, how to give it the experience it needs so that we can feel free to let it out. And if, bear in mind, we do this with human beings. We don't, we don't let little kids sign contracts and we don't let old folks who are entering the second childhood, we don't let them sign contracts either. The, there are two transitions in a, in a human life, one out of childhood into a, adult responsibility and then out of adult responsibility and there was a second childhood. Those are, are huge transitions that we're quite used to we recognize that they're important. And we have to think about a AGIs, if there ever are any, in the same way and recognize that uh, there's no simple test for whether or not such an agent is responsible enough to be allowed, as it were, the, the freedom of, of movement that a, that a human being, a normal human being has, that you and I have, for instance. Well, well thank you very much for all of this. I mean, we've really appreciated your time, Dan. And I also wanna thank Garrett and Stephen for organizing and I want to mention that um, our next event will be October 6th with Yoshia Bengio on causal reasoning and consciousness in AI. And if you like this event, uh, feel free to sign up for our YouTube channel or join our email list. If you're in business and you have, you know, money to donate, hey, send it our way. <laughs> Um, you know, thanks everybody. It's really good to see so many familiar faces here. And uh, Dan, I'm going to follow up with Google and Congress about this. So I really appreciate your time and I'm going to be in touch about the suggestion too. I think there's some positive energy here about the watermark idea. Good. Well, thank you. I, I've enjoyed talking with you. I, I, I've enjoyed seeing the names of a few people I know. Thank you for your attention. Tobias and Chris Delega, I see that you've been attending. I, I, I don't know if I'm missing somebody else, but uh, thanks, thanks for tuning in. And uh, I look forward to another time soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye.